dog, been doing this a long time for about 30, 30 plus years. Um, and 20 years ago, uh, my partner and I, John Folger, we circumnavigated Greenland. And Greenland is, um, they call it an island, but it feels like a continent <laughs> when you drive it around it all down the motor rides. And um, so it's almost exactly 20 years ago now, and we are going to go back to Greenland uh, this coming January. With a, with a film team, and we're going to go there and film the changes that I'm going to see when I go back. So I haven't been all the way around Greenland with John Holger 20 years ago, and it really gives us a baseline for what Greenland was like then, two decades ago, and now we're going back for the first time to see uh, the changes and what's going on. And of course, climate change is playing, playing a big role on that. Um, so what you're going to see, what I'll show you uh, here in a little bit is all the images we took on our circumnavigation. Um, there'll be a little video at the end, and then uh, I'll open it up. Uh, I'll open up the, the discussion and any questions you might have, and then I'll talk about um, what we're going, what we plan to do on this filming project. Um, so I'll, I'll show you a little bit more on that. In a second, then afterwards, I have a bunch of books which have the green, the full Greenland progress uh, story in here. Um, so let's uh, see if we can get going on this. So Greenland, Greenland is a is a is an island, feels like a continent, and Greenland is 1,750 miles long. It's about 750 miles wide. The ice cap in the center part of Greenland is about a mile and a half thick. And what holds that ice cap in the middle of Greenland is a periphery of mountains around the outside of Greenland. And so over the, over the millions of years, ice has built up there and the, and the mountains kind of held it in place. Except for at the fjords where there's, where there, where there's uh, glaciers that kind of fall out of, off the ice cap into fjords depositing, you know, 85% of the northern hemisphere is icebergs. So all the icebergs that we see basically come from Greenland. Now, <clears throat> so this is our exact, this is our exact cir circumnavigation, how we did this, all non-motorized. The blue part is by kayak. So it shows the arrows in the direction. And the, uh, the, uh, the red part is uh, dog sled. The little triangles on the top there are supply depots that I put in two years in advance by Twin Otter Aircraft, and that had to, that involved lots of permission from the, the Danish government and the, uh, the military Cirrus Patrol and permission from the Pentagon to be able to bring dogs in through the airbase and all that kind of stuff. So logistics were, after, you know, just crazy at that time. And it was just two of us trying to raise three quarters of a million dollars on a rotary dial phone and snail mail, right? <laughs> this is before internet, Facebook, all that stuff, you know? So it was, uh, it was a big project, big project. And it would just be two of us. So um, that was 20 years ago, and it has not been circumnavigated since. And uh, it was a big project. Actually, it's, I think as the years go on because of climate change and the, the amount of ice that's melting away, Actually, our circumnavigation will be much easier in the future, right? Because we can do more by water, more of the, the circumnavigation by water. Um, but the little green section at the top, um, those are just like cultural journeys with the Inuit up in the polar Inuit district. Um, and that's where I spend the majority of my time in Greenland is with these polar Inuit. And Polar Inlets are live in four villages up there, Sierrapalut, Kanak, uh, Sabbat Civic, and Kekadet. And there used to be another village, but now it's a band called Moriosa. And so those, uh, um, um, those villages, I think, overall were less than a, you know, about 700 people at the time. So the thing about Greenland, question. Can you go back for a minute and show us where the Arctic Circle is relative to Greenland? Oh, the Arctic Circle? 
circle. Uh, you can see that right circle right down there by a mock loop. Okay. Right down there at the bottom. I don't know if my little. Oh, there we go. Right there. Okay, got it. Thank you. So you can see where conical, long ways above your right circle. Right. Yeah. Um, so Greenland is, and I've always said this, and I and I actually titled one of my books for that. It's where ice is born. <laughs> And I'll tell you, you never get sick. Um, we, John and I never got sick of circumnavigating Greenland or being in Greenland because all the different shapes of ice and stuff were just like, uh, it just kept us uh, entertained uh, around every corner we paddled or around every fjord we dog sledded in. And they came and I call this like a little iceberg graveyard where a bunch of icebergs were like maybe grown on the, on the bottom of the, the ocean there and kind of all sit in one spot. Um, some made it quite majestic where it was two, you know, that can rise up above the waterline 200 feet. And, and, and remember that, they, you know, that 85% uh, of that berg's actually below the waterline, right? Some birds had these huge, like, arches cut in them. And these arches were uh, created when that, when that, ice, when that, before that iceberg was cast off of a glacier, there was a sub uh, glacial river that flowed underneath that uh, glacier, forming this arch in its berg, and then the berg was cast, right? And then from uh, seeing them from above, I mean, so, it, you know, every time we're, every time we're paddling or diving around, we always see something new. Uh, a new shape, and uh, and um, or a, a common sight, you know, waking up in the morning, the uh, sun sitting on all these little birds on the east coast. I mean, it's just so so amazingly beautiful. Um, and then in the southern part of Greenland, where you got the rock faces that are one mile sheer, right down to the waterline, and then you got this this type of ice flows there, or you got sun cupped ice. You know, like this. And so this sun-cupped ice, um, I like this picture of the shot. It looks like kind of a whale tail a little bit. So I just, we put up, we pulled up right next to it, the kayak and, and shot this. And this was back before digital, uh, digital uh, photography. This is all shot on Kodachrome 64 and Valdivia 50 slide film. So <laughs> my partner in, in, in crime for the circumnavigation was John Holger. John Holger's from Australia. And he said, uh, and I like this, I like this shot of him because he's got a, bar, a little jar of peanut butter that says nuts. Um, and he's, and he's always saying, you don't have to be nuts, but it helps. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so John, uh, John spent multiple winters down in Antarctica uh, working with sled dogs there. And then those flood dogs in, Anna, in Antarctica in 1991, 92, when the treaty was imposed in Antarctica, removed all non-indigenous species from the continent, those dogs ended up moving, uh, moving north up to Ely, Minnesota, where John accompanied those flood dogs. Uh, and then those dogs then uh, found a home at Wintergreen and uh, home with Bonk Creek. And so when I met John there, he was, uh, uh, very uh, joyful, happy-go-lucky guy, uh, loved working with sled dogs, and because of his happy-go-lucky attitude and his experience of spending winters in Antarctica, I asked him, I said, hey John, would you want to try to tackle going around Greenland with me? And he said, sure. He said, that's, uh, and we, we were basically tied to the hip for five and a half years. Um, how we were going to how we were gonna um, kayak Greenland, and Greenland coastline is very, very dangerous. So, because of high winds and big seas, so we took two Mackey, uh, I forget, Narva kayaks that could be actually catamaran together to form, form a cat, and then we could use these little, little sails, rollery sails, to be able to sail these boats if we could. Well, the way the conditions ended up and the way the wind, uh, prevailing winds were, we could only sail, uh, we only sailed 316 miles of 3,500. Now, 
of the kayak. Because when, when the conditions were good for sailing, that means the, the storm was coming. And you could only sail for a couple hours, then you had to get off the water and find shelter. Uh, and then later we realized that it would, it's much better to use um, much better to use a double uh, plastic kayak for speed, stability, and safety. That way if we got turned over in a double kayak, the other person would be right there, you'd never get separated from your team member, they could right, help you right the boat, pump it out, stabilize the boat so you can get in, and then you can stabilize the boat for him to get in here off and run it again. So uh, when people ask me, what's the best kayak to use for expedition use? I would say a tandem, unless you're going solo, of course, but a tandem, and I would highly recommend a tandem. So. Hey, Lonnie, did you ever capsize? Yeah, we capsized, and uh, I'll tell you, I'll tell you about a time we capsized. Uh, <laughs> you know, it was the first and only time we ended up in the water kayaking. So what happened is we were kayaking alongside the shore, and we're kayaking next to the shore, actually next to a cliff. And um, oftentimes, because of tide and wave action, uh, there's always open water between a cliff and the ice. Whereas, you might have solid ice for five miles out to sea. So you can't really kayak there, and you don't want to be kayaking five miles out to sea in case there's a big wind, blows you out to sea, um, and then you're lost forever. But you want to stay close into the coastline. So we're in there, we're, we're paddling in, wiggling around the coast. We've got an area of open water, maybe, I don't know, 50 feet wide is the way we went in. And then way in the distance, a big iceberg, like one of the icebergs you've seen earlier there, calved off a chunk of ice the size of maybe two houses, right? Just calved it off. And um, what happened is that created a tidal wave that you can't really see. So the tidal wave starts from underneath, uh, starts right at the berg, and then gets to the ice and goes underneath the ice, and it's kind of hidden, right? But until it starts getting close to the land, it, it then builds up. So what happened is we were kayaking there, and here comes this tidal wave, and we couldn't really see it because the ice dampened it. And then when it got to shore, it picked up our, our kayak like this, like maybe, I don't know, seem like maybe 50 foot up the side of the uh, uh, cliff, and, our, and, be, and as it was receding, our plastic boat caught on the rocks, flipped the boat upside down, and as we were going down with that wave, it sucked down an eye out from, under the, out from our cockpit and deposited, deposited it underneath the ice. So I, I, I'm, I'm under, under the ice, I open up my eyes, and I can see this little red plastic thing floating on the edge of the ice pan, and I swam, you know. I'm swimming, and I'm swimming, and I'm swimming, and I get to this, I get to the hull of the boat, and I pop up, and I'm spitting, spitting water, and coughing, and, and I get up, and I'm, I'm frantic, and I'm swimming around the boat looking for John. John's not, nowhere to be seen. All our stuff is floating in the water, right? And all of a sudden, John pops up about 25 feet away um, after, after gulping quite a bit of water. And we managed to, you know, managed to get out. We were completely soaked, we were hypothermic. Uh, we had dry suits on, but our, our neck uh, gussets were, uh, were starting to leak by then because we'd been paddling for many, many you know, weeks, months at that time in those suits. And so we just spent the rest of the day gathering our stuff that was floating around. We lost a few things. We got to shore and we just put everything out to dry. Of course, nothing dries on a Greenland coast, but whatever we hung it up. And then we ate, we pounded down tons of food and uh, made some hot drinks to just stave off the hypothermia. And then we uh, we just crashed in some sleep bags on the rocks, um, basically shivering until morning. And then we got everything loaded back up, and then we carried on again. But that was one time we ended up in the water. <laughs> one and only time. And so we, ever since then, we were super, super careful about what icebergs were doing around us and how close to the shore you are, right? So 
lot of people say, oh, ice cream's breaking, run to shore. No, no, no. No, go, go out to sea. You don't want that uh, tidal wave coming and snagging them up. Yes? No, we weren't wearing PFDs. We didn't. We only wore PFDs on certain crossings on the west coast. We didn't wear PFDs because our our dry suits would actually um, our Gore-Tex dry suits, which actually would puff up when we got into the cold water because we had warm water underneath. They kind of puffed up and they kept us floating. It's not like we we're going to be in the water more than you know 15 minutes at the most, generally. And then, uh, so we did. We didn't wear too many suits. I was just thinking. They can be a hindrance in that situation for sure. Yeah. The other question I had is, was it worth it to bring the sail and the gear to catamaran your kayak? Uh, absolutely it? not. <laughs> <laughs> we learned that early on. Um, it just didn't. Uh, it just didn't pan out like we thought it was gonna. We ended up basically paddling the whole thing. Did you dust it? What's that? Did you dust it? Uh, no, no. Uh, everything, uh, anything that we had we, uh, that we couldn't use, we left in the community for the community. Yeah. So that didn't include the sale? What's that? That didn't include the sale and mast? Uh, the, well, the thing with the, so there, we, we played around with a lot of different masks. We had a roller reef one, but the other one we, uh, we were playing around with an asymmetrical spinnaker and a bendable mast on a, on a fiberglass uh, rod. That in case if we got hit with a really uh, quick, fast, uh, gust the wind, it would knock the boat over. The mast would bend a little bit, dump the wind, and right itself. So that was a technique that we we uh, developed years ago for sailing kayaks, quasi fishing. Um, let's see, I was going to go that. Okay. So um, this is a typical community in uh, the west coast of Greenland. This is a place called Supernavik. This is a very north, well, not in. Not as far north as Connick, but um, um, uh, I don't know, it's uh, quite a bit further north than Newt, the capital. And what I wanted to uh, show you is what a, basically a summer scene on the west coast of uh, Greenland looks like. And this is what a typical community looks like with all the primary colors uh, in the houses. And why they do that is because your landscape is basically ice and rock, right? That's all you see. And they always wanted color because when the hunters got back from hunting or people got back from gathering and stuff, they got to the community and just put a smile on your face, you know? So that's the reason for the, the nice color. Um, so on the west coast, which is most of what the kayak, uh, what I'm going to talk to you about here, I'm choosing the east coast, um, is traveling along this coastline is called the Blossaville Coast. And the Blossaville Coast is a really nasty section of kayaking, which is basically 3,000 foot cliffs right down to the water. Very few places to get out and camp. So you had to really study the map on each Greenland to figure out how far can we travel today and do we have a place to camp, okay? Because you don't want to go camp out on the floating ice in case you, um, in case a, a pitiless wind comes and blows you out to sea. Uh, so you always want to be able to camp on shore each night and in a safe spot on shore. Because if you're camped in a bad spot and again a wave comes in and grabs you, it'll take your whole camp and your boat and everything out to sea. So you want to make sure you're protected as well. Plus, you want to be in an area where you know for danger you're never going to lose your boat. Because if your boat goes bye-bye and you're not in it, you're dead. Simple. You're dead. No one's going to come get you. No one's going to know you're there. We didn't have all kinds of communications equipment that you have today. This is completely, you know, we're, we're traveling there uh, completely on our own. Ain't nobody gonna come get you. It was back, back in the days where you know, that there wasn't that type of sophisticated communication stuff. Um, and then you get, you know, um, you got the Arctic Ocean, right? So the Arctic Ocean has got all this sea ice and it has to come out somewhere, and it comes out between Europe and Greenland, and it hugs around, hugs down the Greenland coastline, and it hugs down the east side of Greenland, and then it eventually rounds the southern tip of Greenland and goes up the west coast, and it goes all the way kind of up to uh, Ellesmere Island in Canada, and then it goes down the Canadian coast past Labrador, Newfoundland, that's how the ice travels. So here at this northern, you know, 
eastern part of Greenland, you're getting the brunt of the Arctic Ocean sea ice coming. Yeah. And so when Donna and I have a hard time figuring out how, where to paddle because we got all this ice in front of us, um, a lot of times we'd have to park the boat uh, near an iceberg, climb up to the top of the iceberg to view the route ahead and see what's going on. And sometimes we had to, you know, they just clambered on top of some rocks or whatever. And so I would go up there with a map, get a good look of the surroundings, put that in my memory, and, and then we would get back in the kayak and we'd try to assimilate what I what I see seen so we could wiggle through this area. And sometimes, you know, sometimes the ice just got um, you know so bad that we just had to pull out on an ice pan, look at the map, look at the land marks ahead of us, figure out what the ice is doing how it's drifting, and where there could potentially be open water for us to go. So it was a guessing game, but we became so in tune with the environment and what the sea ice is doing and what the tides are doing and what the currents are doing and what the landmarks ahead would be doing to the ice that we could, you know, just, we could, we could kind of calculate where we needed to go to wiggle, wiggle our way south. And then, uh, and then we got into what we call consolidated brash ice. And this is ice that's been through the blender, thrown in there. You can, you, you can't stand on top of it, but you can probably lay on it and it would hold you, but you couldn't stand on it. So paddling through this stuff is almost impossible, almost impossible. So what John and I developed are these gap hooks. We've got a two foot long stick, great big humongous fish hook on the end, latched to the end. And then we would reach ahead, grab some ice together in this boat, and we'd shift ahead a half a boat length at a time. And then we would do it again. And then we'd do it again until everybody could move. Either there or try to sleep where we're sitting, which we did a few times, because they're so exhausted. And then we'd do it again, and we'd do it again. And then we'd wiggle our way to some open water, or we'd wiggle our way to a place to camp or whatever. And then the next day, you never know, this could be all open water. The very next day, it could be just all open water. So it just depends on tides and shifting. Um, and then sometimes it's just, you had such big solid ice band, there was no other choice but to pull your boat. And so we'd, uh, we had plastic neck camera. Um, this is, the, the wonderful thing about these little neck camera is they were bomb-proof. They were plastic, we could drag them over rocks and ice and fully loaded, no problem. And we could get 42 days worth of food in one of these boats, little boats. It would barely float. I mean, we put 42 days in there, and then John and I sit in there, and like the, the water went like, where did it get big enough? Like, okay, I don't think we can put any more food in there. And it was great because when I looked at the owner's manual for this uh, Necky Amarok when I first bought it, it said it's great for weekend getaways. <laughs> you know? And so it was just like, yeah, this is working out pretty good. <laughs> and then of course we're uh, when you're up on the ice moving around like this, you in the uh, in the realm of the polar bear, of course, and we have this I have this little polar bear story I want to tell you. We uh, John and I were paddling, right? We're paddling next to the shore, and I look way up on the side of this mountain, and there's this bear up there. Uh, just lounging around in the snow way up. I don't know what it was doing up there. They had two little cubs with it, with her, and they were playing in the snow up there. And for some reason, she stopped like playing because she heard like one of our paddles hitting the ice. And she you know, stood up a little bit, and then she got down and she slid like a big sled, boom, down this mountain, boom, 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 and boom, she's right there. <laughs> she's, right, she's right there, you know, and. And, and the little cubs coming behind her, and I'm going, oh, this is bad, you know, we're tied to these kayaks right here. Um, that happens to be a marine mammal. Uh, what are we going to do? So um, we uh, luckily, luckily, after she smelled us, she took off the other direction as fast as she could. So she must have either been hunting, been hunted before, or uh, we just dumped so bad after. <laughs> uh, but we're getting kind of played out, you know, we're getting
getting a, a rook and cuts on our shoulder and we're getting played out and yeah, I'm tired and we, we you know, we've been, you know, it's that 3,500 miles of kayaking. And so it gets, it starts playing on you. Here we were wearing a PFD, as you see, and anytime we had really super dangerous long crossings um, where we potentially could end up in the water, we wore those uh, in addition to some dry suits. Um, the Blossomville Coast, like I was saying, uh, paddling right next to shore like this. This is a very typical um, uh, cliff that I had mentioned earlier where our boat went up, hooked on those jagged rocks, pushed us over. Um, Who took that photo? Yeah. I, uh, I took my camera, I put it on a little mini tripod, set the timer, and let it go. Outside the boat? On, on the Greenland expedition, we lost eight cameras. <laughs> <laughs> Some video, video cameras, too. All together, eight. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there again, Blossomville Coast, very steep shoreline right to the water. But this little section between the cliff and the main pack ice left you a little bit of open water because of the tide. And the waves would open that up for paddling. It means you had to go a little bit farther because you had to follow the coastline part of that way but uh, still uh, uh, better than dragging the boat into the sea ice. Sometimes there was no place to camp, so we just uh, put, a, put some rock protection in the rocks, tie the, uh, tie the boat up onto the rocks, and go up and sleep with the birds uh, for the night. We're picking up some fresh water, drinking water there. Salt water, that was all salt water, but uh, we, got, we got a lot of fresh water from uh, 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 glacial streams coming off from, from our end. And then, you know, this is uh, uh, about not impossible to camp here, but it's uh, trying to get a flat spot from some big boulders like that is near impossible. And then you got some nice sections of big flat rock that you just sprawl out on. And, and, uh, but this uh, this is a typical scene in the East Greenland. You see the icebergs kind of piled up in that bay there. So what John and I did, because we couldn't take a lot you know, sometimes we couldn't take enough food to make the distance and there was no way to resupply in the way. So what we would do is sometimes fish. And so we would put, you know, we'd get uh, a long string, we'd put a couple of hooks on it, we'd bait it with some pepperoni and maybe whatever piece of cheese, whatever we had, you know, and we would throw it in the water on a, on a weight and then the next morning before we'd start kayaking, we'd pull that line in. Well, we usually always had at least a cod fish or a flounder. And then we'd have that for dinner that night. And uh, sometimes we, we also carry a, a small 410, uh, small 410 shotgun on, the, on board uh, that we would, we could get sea dust in, in, in an emergency. Um, when we got a little further south, we got a little further south, we would switch over to uh, uh, going up into the hills and getting berries, black, old blackberries, and then we'd also get uh, mushrooms. Because all the mushrooms that you can find in Greenland are, were edible, and so we did mushrooms and berries, and even further south, deep in the fjords, we'd pick unending supplies of big, beautiful blue mussels. We had mussels for dinner, and then uh, combined with, you know, duck and what fish, you know, we, we, could, we could get by pretty well. Um, but um, unless we 
you're doing a winter project and you ever actually just put a wing on, um, unless you're doing a winter, a hard winter project or some kind of mountain climbing project, you can put the wing on a little bit, especially if it's a long trip. Um, yeah. Like on, like doing the North Pole trip, we put on maybe, we try to put on 20 pounds. We were lucky if we got 15 pounds on before we left. But that's quite a bit, you know, because you're going to lose double that. I got lost on uh, the North Pole trip, I lost 34 pounds um, by the time I did. 34 pounds in 60 days of travel. So that's a half a ton of body you're, you're losing. You're losing, dragging your stuff. Because you're dragging, uh, you, know, uh, you know, depending on you know, where, where you are on your trip, but like between 100 and 225 pounds plus for a marathon a day, you're going to burn. Uh, and then journal taking. Uh, I took I, I took a journal every day. I was on that on that trip. I don't journal much anymore, but uh, um, it was a nice way to just relax, get in tune with your surroundings, try to not forget the the, the spicy parts of each day, and talk about the fox that came to visit the or the fox that came to visit the camp, and things like that. Because I did see. There was so much to take in that I didn't want to forget uh, what uh, what Green had taught us and, and showed us each day. Uh, we came across uh, this uh, when we were just about ready to finish the kayaking portion of the expedition. We came across this little Norwell hunting shack. It was like the first hard shack that we could like duck into uh, to get out of the weather and stuff. We loved our little tent, but any kind of change was was nice. We could hang stuff up and try stuff and get out of the weather. And then getting into the village after we've been gone uh, over two months now, there's a little village called Ether's Hill. And then this is a little house with a sled. Uh, Still got its fat on the inside, 
And they sewed that seal skin up really super tight with maybe two, three hundred birds in that seal skin. And they usually sew everything up except for just a little hole and then all the kids will jump up and down on this seal skin with all those little birds on it to get the air out. <laughs> and then once all the air is out of this little seal skin, they finish doing the last little bit of sticking. So now it's completely airtight, kind of vacuum packed. Then they put a bunch of these big seal skins full of birds on the docks and they bring it out to the um, north side of a hill where they'll take those seal skins off the sledge, put it on the side of the hill where it can't get any sun. And then they put big rocks on top of this seal skin so it creates even more pressure. So it doesn't get any sun, it's under pressure, it's cool, it's, it never gets above freezing. And so over the course of three or four months that these little birds are in the seal skin, they're fermenting. And they're fermenting ever so slowly that it's, it's not, it's, it's, it makes the birds completely edible in four or five months down the road. This is called kibia. So they open up these seal skins at the end of four or five months, partially frozen, and these little greasy birds come out, you know, they pick up the feathers on them, and then you just peel that greasy, those greasy feathers off with the skin, and you eat the birds raw. And so that's kibia, because they, they eat that a lot through the winter. And it's that, specific um, um, food that really kept the polar ants alive uh, out there through the, through the, all through the years with those little birds. And uh, because there were certain times of years that it was hard to get marine mammals or hard to get seals or hard to get fish, but they could always rely on these little birds. Say, what do they use for fuel? They use whale oil? Well, in the old days, they used, uh, they just pounded, uh, they used fat and seal skin lamb. So it's either fat from walrus or polar bear or uh, any kind of marine mammal fat. So they'll pound the fat with a meat tenderizer to break up the fat cells in the fat, and then they put it on a piece of soap, soapstone that is carved to capture the grease, and they pull that grease up to an edge that is lit and stays lit and they put her when she was cooking. Nowadays, of course, they got diesel. They, they got a ship that can come to these villages twice a year and bring supplies from Denmark, whether it's diesel for heating your homes or what have you. Um, so they can, they can do that. These are just some little kids in Syropolis. They're pretty proud of their little bird that they got. And that's the, uh, that's the, the little uh, hawk. Can I share a story with you all? Yeah. I had the chance to wine and talk with some people on this journey. <laughs> and it's nothing like what we know. I mean, the experience is incredible. You, you basically start by tearing the little legs off that make the little hole that's in it, and then you suck the juice out. That's like step one. <laughs> and then and they walk you through the steps, and then you peel the skin off. And then it was like, okay, at this part, we're going to open the beak, and you're going to pull the tongue out. <laughs> and that was like a treat. <laughs> and then you get to the head and it was just like you, you actually put it in enough, like enough that hurt. And you can you get brains out of it. <laughs> and then this continues, but like the, this, this, this could sell it in some of the different circles. Uh, so, yeah, so anyways, these little kids, I stayed with this family for a while. And uh, it seems like a long time ago. So I got, this, so like this picture, I'm gonna be going back now in January, and I'm gonna be in Greenland for four months doing a film on then and now. What it was like then, and what am I gonna find out now? And so I'm taking uh, uh, photos like this on a foam core, blown up. And I'm gonna go in search of these kids that are now 20 years older, right? So. I, I came here, it was a long time ago, I can't remember their names, I don't even know if I'll be able to find their house. But if I show any one person in that village that picture, they're gonna know exactly who these people are. And so that will help open the door for us to do uh, a film in, in Greenland, um, in, in these communities. Um, 
so the Polar Inuit, this is how they dress today. They got seal skin boots, polar bear pants, blue fox coat each other parka, trimmed in fox tail. They have all the polar bear skin vests on that they usually do. But uh, he's wearing he actually instead of seal skin pants, he's got polar bear pants. When he's uh, Savasivic, he is the the main hunter in uh, Savasivic for polar bear. And uh, he wanted to show his uh, new outfit. He had had sewn up special for him for that season. Now a pair of polar bear pants, though, uh, that he's wearing there, they'll last a hunter continuous use for five years. Five years. Of, of, of use. So they wear these pants just not only for um, dog sledding, but they use them for kayaking too. Because they're a marine mammal, they're kind of waterproof. It's like, you know, nature's door check. They can just get into a kayak and those polar bear pants provide really nice cushion while you're sitting in your kayak and it keeps your legs nice and warm. And then dog sledding as well. It's just, just a really super good pair of pants. So it's like Carhartt, if you know, it's like a Carhartt for these guys. And so they, they wear, they, they, like I said, they'll wear them for five years before they have to replace them. So they don't need to, they don't need to hunt lots of polar bears to have pants because these pants last for so long. Here's another shot of some uh, uh, kids from Savage Civic. So again, I can bring this image into that community. All of these uh, kids now are young adults. Did you have an interpreter, or what, what kind of languages do you speak? Uh, well, these 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 guys speak uh, straight up a, a Um but uh, back then um, uh, we had uh, I had a friend uh, named Tina. She's from Denmark, so most kids are taught Danish. And so my Danish friend would translate from Danish to English to me. And then some of the, uh, I would say, late teens, you know, late teenagers, they would know a little bit of English, but the elders wouldn't know any of it. And uh, so that, we kind of got by that way. And then we picked up a little bit of the Dutch until along the way as well. So that's a picture of Sabbath Pacific from the Grinner. All the, you can see all the Inuit dogs sleeping near the meat racks uh, in the village. Those are, they just recently got these two bears out on the ice uh, a few, not that long ago. This is an old bear dog. You can see it's pretty scarred up from fighting. It's got scars on his face. These are meat, what's called meat racks. They'll put the walrus and seal meat up on these. There's another one over there put their kayaks up there to keep them in good shape. Did you say bear dogs? Well, all the Inuit dogs are used to uh, hunt, hunt, hunt polar bears. They're used for hunting in general, smelling a seal hole, a uh, breathing seal hole, uh, uh, alerting the hunter that there might be uh, caribou in the hills uh, or the smell of musk ox or whatever. So the hunter's always using these dogs and these dogs will also uh, uh, chase down a polar bear and keep it at bay and keep the bear off the hunter so the hunter doesn't get killed until the hunter can kill the bear. Uh, this is sun bleached seal skin. So the, this seal, seal skin is scraped of fat and hair on both sides and then it's bleached in the sun. And this, uh, this makes a very waterproof material that is used to make hammocks or footwear and handwork. Uh, for, yeah. Most of them use them in footwear. This is, uh, this is a, hunting, a hunter who spent some time with me um, while I was there. His name is Namagitsuk. Namagitsuk Christensen. He had a Danish last name. And uh, he's a Perfect specimen <laughs> And then they, uh, they, we're doing a little fishing, like I told you, maybe told you earlier, um, where they bait all these hooks with some squid, and they put them on this. Uh, they hook one line to this big metal 
couple sheets here to one line, and then they bend it down in the water, and that kind of airplane type metal sheet will slide in the water horizontally underneath the ice, pulling these hooks that are made of squid behind it, and it might float that, that line out maybe 100 yards away. And all those hooks with squid lay on the bottom of the, the, the fjord, and then the halibut, the Greenland halibut, come and get caught on those. And every once in a while, they'll even pull up a, a Greenland shark or something like that. Now, these two people I traveled with a lot up there. This is, uh, this is uh, Mamarud, who's baiting the hook, and Chakumik Perry behind him. And Chakumik Perry is the great, great granddaughter of Robert E. Perry, who went to the North Pole. There's a Greenland halibut coming up there. You can see the, the little reel behind. That's where you crank up the line with all the hooks and the fish on it. We're doing that. The dogs are the dogs are uh, the dogs are just taking a break while we're catching fish. And then this is Kusakov uh, Henson. He's a great great grandson of Matthew Henson, which accompanied Robert Perry to the North Pole. Traveling with him. Uh, here we're cutting up some seal uh, for the dogs, and the dogs are all waiting nice and patiently for their dinner. Um, and the seal, because it's a little warmer now, we've taken all the fat off the outside of the seal because they don't need that much calorie. And we dice the seal up, and each dog gets about a kilo and a half of food a day. And then uh, John and I are getting ready to start our dog sled expedition around the north, and so I try to get as much information from the Inuit elders as possible um, about conditions in the north. Some of them have been up quite high. And this uh, this this uh, fellow, this name is Alexiak. And this is Connick, and we're loading up our dog, and we're starting to head, and we're starting to. Uh, Get set up to leave Connick and go on our dog sled expedition on the north. Yes. Have you seen that? Oh, oh yeah. Okay, so we need people coming in. Yeah. So we have about uh, we have another bit to go, and I didn't know if people wanted to just take a break and maybe grab hit the bathroom so we can come back here in another five minutes, or is everybody okay? Or? Keep going. Keep going. Okay. Great. All right. Um, so now the dog sled journey. Um, loading up, loading down the conic to start heading north. And our team, John and I team, we had uh, we, we had uh, 13 dogs on our expedition. Um, and this is our team here, going around Cape May in the north part of Greenland. Um, when storm did come up, we the dogs. We just have the dogs sit and. Uh, uh, they'll usually put their backs towards the storm, will help untangle their lines, uh, kind of brush the snowballs off of their fur and stuff, and get them, um, get them ready to go again. Uh, but we got quite a storm coming up here, so we're not sure if we're going to keep traveling or not. Um, the temperature is minus 58 degrees below zero. That's straight temperature, no wind chill. And uh, you can see John's pretty pretty frozen here. And then it's so cold, matter of fact, that the plastic on our sled won't slide anymore. It's too abrasive. The colder it gets, the more abrasive the snow gets, the more granular it gets. It's like pushing your sled across sand. And so the best way to counter that is to ice the bottom of your runner. And so we flip the sled over, and our plastic runners, they, they are overhung a little bit on both sides of the runner. And so we do what we do is we take cotton batting that comes in a spool. We take some hot water out of our thermos, put it on that batting, and then we roll that batting out over the plastic and form it. And as we form it over the plastic chewing, it freezes solid. And that freezes solid in the sheet of ice, and then we slowly smooth it out with more ice or with more water. 
or we uh, will shave it a little bit with a carpenter's plane to get it completely smooth. And then when you put it back, turn the sled back over, it glides almost like on its own. It works really good. Ice against ice. John's chopping ice here to uh, he help to drink some water in the tent. We space the dog out evenly around the tent to act as polar bear alarm clocks. They don't take the bears away to come in at night. Um, I feed the dogs uh, pemmican, which is uh, basically some freeze-dried dog food with fat and stuff like that. About 6,000 calories a kilo. And then I give the dogs manicures every now and then. All, all 14 of them clip your nails, cut some of the hair back around their pads so they don't get it snow all caught in there. And then this is our typical tent setup, uh, sled right next to the tent. We got our we got our communication radio right here with the antenna. We can communicate up to 600 miles. And uh, um, but we couldn't communicate only we could only communicate 600 miles. So we basically communicated with these remote scientific bases that were either stationed in Canada or stationed in Greenland. And then they would relay information further south, and then they would relay information further south, and then finally our family would get the information. That way we were still, still alive. That's our communication device right there. John's putting some ice in the teapot. Caillou, uh, Caillou uh, one, of our, one of our sled dogs is keeping lock, keep locked. And, and these are, this is the Oak Ridge Boys. <laughs> <laughs> They're keeping locked as well, making sure everybody's safe. And then all of a sudden we get this, we get this growling. And I look out of the tent, and we got a pack of polar wolves trying to come in to eat our sled dog. And these polar wolves, I was so excited that they came, I couldn't get my camera focused. It was cold, I was tired. I was just trying, I just wanted to capture it. I didn't even care if it was in powder because we couldn't believe these are the northernmost wolves in the world. Now, Dave Meech and Jim Brandenburg photographed some wolves years ago on Elgin Island, but these, but these wolves are even further north than those by several hundred miles. And these are just a pack of four, only show three here. And they were just trying to come in to kill the dog, to eat the dog. But luckily we got out and when they seen us, they, they, they scampered off. But I was quite amazed. Now, wolves that live that far north, they only have a couple things that they can eat. Uh, muskox, small herds of muskox, or seals that are sleeping on the ice in the springtime. They can, they can catch seal. Uh, so this is heading around the northern part of Greenland. This is uh, up in Fairyland. This is the edge of the Arctic Ocean. Now that, that is what the Arctic Ocean looks like when it's pressured up. Right? So from here, about 438 miles is the North Pole from this location. John and I climbed the National Geographic flag on the northernmost land in the world. This is Kapakuban Island. You can see Greenland in the distance. That's the northern coast of Greenland in the distance. And this is the northern edge of the island with a little carn on it um, called Kapakuban. And that carn was placed by Robert Perry. Starting to head south now, we're on the north, heading back to finishing up the dog sled journey. It's a nice, what do we call it, sun dog, full sun dog. And then we arrived at Connacht 90, 90, 92 days later uh, after our dog sled journey. Um, and I'm holding up Canute, which is our lead dog. <laughs> so we're pretty, pretty tired, pretty beat up, but we're glad to be back. So now, uh, so that, that, was, that all happened 20 years ago, and now this January, uh, Pascal and I and a team of film people are gonna go 
to Greenland here, we're going to see what we can find. Start to search for some of the, the people and the kids that we met and uh, uh, see how climate change is affecting their lifestyle and try to tell that in a, in, in a film, through a film. But it's, it's not going to be a, a film that's going to be uh, a kind of like, there's plenty of films that are really, you know, really direct on climate change. This is going to be more about culture and the stories we tell with, about the culture is going to tell the story about climate change without even having to mention it. Uh, so that's that's what our plan is. And then um, um, I put a little video together uh, for you about some of the things that we are going to lose uh, in Minnesota and other places in the north due to, due to climate change if we don't get it stopped today. <laughs> right? um, um, and then I, I have a bunch of uh, books here that has multiple expeditions in, maybe four or five expeditions in here, including the whole story of Greenland in here. I'd be welcome to, I'd, I'd be glad to sign those for anybody in the long run. Uh, and, uh, and I'll answer questions after this as well. We do have a little time. <laughs> Doable within one day, right? And so, um, 
it, it might mean for a short day or it might mean for a super long day. And so that was any that was usually was anywhere from uh, you know fifteen to twenty-five miles, something like that. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? How long are you going back? Yeah. District where I'm going to have some garage there. We're going to be traveling by garage into all the villages there. And there we're going to, that's where we're going to spend most of our time. Although we will go to the East Coast a little bit, but we're going to go there by sailboat out of Iceland because there's a section of the East Coast that was one of the most compelling places that I've ever been. It's a place called the Cane Lucalock. And it's this deep fjord that has, it's like an oasis for marine life there that has, is home to narwhals and carp seals and all, all the, all the, the various uh, uh, whales that you have up there as well. And, uh, and then the topography is amazing. Uh, there's some big, huge escarpments coming down with glaciers pouring over the top of them. And anyway, we're going to go there by sailboat. And we're going to do some filming there. Um, but uh, and in addition to that, we're going to do we're going to ski up onto the ice cap from there to try to find a a cairn that was uh, put in place in 1934. And so this we, we know where the cairn is located, uh, but no one has been there since, and we want to go there and document the note that's in it and what's there at this time. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. Right, there's uh, multiple kangaroo collects, and kangaroo collect means a big fjord, or king fjord. And so there's a kangaroo clock on the left coast of the Clarex, that's an airport. Uh, but there's also multiple kangaroo collects on the east coast and various places. So, so uh, kangaroo clock, you see where the, uh, 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 the 690 miles July to September 2001, that indent there, that fjord there is kangaroo clock. Okay. Yeah, maybe I missed that so then, yeah. So that's kangaroo clock fjord. So we're gonna sail from Iceland to kangaroo clock to do some filming in there, and then Pascal and I are gonna ski to the ice cap to locate a car that's currently there. Um, there. Aren't there connections you have with that fjord um, <coughs> the first time that you have been? I spent, John and I spent a lot of time there we actually found some uh, ancient inland encampments from the Thule era in this in this area. Uh, we also found interesting mineral um, um, not deposits, but um, when we were kayaking along this cliff, there was a vein of copper copper that was coming out of the water uh, up into this cliff about this thick, that solid copper. Uh, this is that turquoise green, you know, after it's oxidizes, which is pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. So there's just a lot of cool spots. Mainly animals, so we have a little animal here. Um, any other questions? Um, yeah, I want to thank you for coming. If anybody's interested in a, in a book, yes? So the, the car that you said you're going to just like find the Yeah, I
build a snare and the, the cracks still be there, is it going to be buried after several years of snow and ice and good morning summers? And, or is it going to be way up because ice caps uh, melted down? So it's going to be interesting. Yeah. Talk to a little bit about how you raised two million dollars then. Sorry, about what? How you raised two million dollars then, and, and what would you do differently now if you were a young explorer and you're planning a trip like this? How would you go approach it differently? Yeah, so obviously raised the sum of the money that it took to do this back then. Well, it was this back then. I, I call this uh, when we were doing expeditions back then. It was uh, kind of the modern. Right at the, uh, the at the age of exploration, and then the, at the at the end of the age of exploration, there was a few projects that were still left undone, and so this modern age of exploration um, kind of took off where the old explorers left over, like uh, Perry and Nansen and and and, and those guys. And, and so there were still some very significant projects to do, and it was then fairly straightforward to raise money for these expeditions because we would go to companies like Geographic and uh, 3M or DuPont or uh, the Smithsonian and we or, or Rolex, and we would say that, hey, there are these geographical first projects that still haven't been done yet, you know, are you interested in funding them? And they would. Now, naturally, funding, trying to fund stuff, back then, everything was done on just a rotary dial phone and uh, snail mail, which made it tough, because I would send out six or seven project proposals, um, you know, and uh, shoot them out. And two weeks later, I'd call them up, I'd say, hey, did you get that proposal? And, you know, half of them would end up in the garbage, you know? And so, like, I don't know how many proposals we sent out all together, maybe 700. That's six or seven dollars a piece back then by the time you printed everything out and mailed it. And we get one or two percent of those proposals. But that one and two percent was enough to cover the expedition. Um, today, it's much difficult, more difficult, because everybody's got. Everybody can take pictures, everybody can do um, with their smartphones, and, and everybody's documenting every uh, trail and everything that's going on. So it's harder to compete. It's harder to separate yourself from what's going on then. That was exploration, and a lot of what's going on today is sport, right? And so it's, it's, it's different to, it's harder Hope that National Geographic understand this a little bit more because they've been in the exploration business long enough, or the Royal Canadian Geographic Society, or or what have you. They understand expeditions, but trying to sell an expedition to somebody like you know whatever cargo, whatever 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 uh, company you're trying to reach out to, it's it's hard to. It's hard to explain why this is different than everything else. And so, and then you got all the social media, right? That's just, it's just different now. It's just so much different. And before our media consists, you know, most of the mainstream media consists of radio, television, newspapers, magazines, magazines, that was it. We had all those contacts. We know we knew those people. So we could we could get buzz going on those major media outlets. Once we get the buzz going, then we get the sponsors interested, and the sponsors are interested. Well, can you get exclusive? You know, I said we can get exclusive on in this magazine or this, and then they'll say, yeah, we're on board for so much money, right? And we'll whip their logos and we'll we'll mention them, uh, try to get them mentioned in, in, in some of that stuff, or while we're doing radio interviews, things like that. But today, it's it's a, it's much different. Everything social media, a lot of it's social media. And so, um, um, you know, it's Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, all, all that stuff that is hard to get seen on, right? It's hard to, and, and, and then there's, there's, there's a whole other thing, like how many followers do you have and, and, and all that stuff. Well, any, most any 
anybody can get a half a million followers, you can just buy them or search them up. But to get organic followers is a different thing where you have people that are dedicated you know, to your project. It's just a much, it's a different, it's just a whole different ball game now. It's, uh, it's just hard to keep up with. I get quite, I get quite tired with it all, but uh, uh, luckily we, uh, we don't have to raise the kind of money that we used to have to raise, so we can do other projects. But uh, it costs a little more, a little, a little uh, less costly. But those big expeditions in the early days were, were quite expensive. Yeah. Uh, we have one more question. Some are, are winter, and so um, there's a lot of um, 